Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think it is time to start again. I go to the chapter one in the book, Anatomical and Physiological Basis of Bioelectromagnetism. So I assume that you have studied in high school the anatomy and physiology of uh, uh, humans and animals, but still I'd like to tell you some issues about the anatomy and physiology, those issues which are essential in the sense of bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena. I start with nerve and muscle cells. Santiago Ramon Ucajal and Camilo Golgi received in 1906 the Nobel Prize of Physiology or Medicine in recognition of their work on the structure of the nervous system. Uh, especially important was uh, this uh, staining method which gave a possibility uh, to find and describe the anatomy of the cells. Staining, which means uh, uh, coloring, coloring the uh, cells. A beautiful, beautiful pictures made by Santiago Ramon Cajal and Camilo Golgi. Here is one beautiful drawing of a cell. Cells are very, very complicated structures. That is the basic structure of the, of the body. There are several, several different kind of uh, structures and details which are essential for the living and development of the cell, but uh, not directly for bioelectric, oops, bioelectric phenomena. So I do not go into the details of all these, uh, these uh, structures, but we just find that the cell is uh, surrounded by the cell membrane, where it is said, plasma membrane here, and uh, inside there is uh, uh, nucleus, and within the nucleus is a nucleolus. This is just the core of the cell carrying the uh, genetic information, and the structures which are essential for, for the, the maintaining the life of the cell. The membrane. Membrane is important uh, of course, it is important also in the sense of bioelectric phenomena. I tell you how the cell membrane is uh, uh, built up, how it is constructed. It has a very interesting, in principle, a simple structure, but please never think that the nature is simple. Never think. It is very complicated. But for engineers, I like to show how the membrane is uh, uh, constructed in this way. It is constructed from phospholipid molecules. Phospholipid molecules have a, like, a ta like a head and two tails. Well, uh, these are just uh, uh, images. Uh, uh, when speaking about head, it doesn't have a brain and think something. When speaking about tails, it doesn't uh, swim with the tails. No, it just looks like a head and tails. The head is constructed from phosphoric acid. Chemically, that attracts water. It, it tries to take water closer. And the tails are constructed from glycerid. Chemically, the glycerid repels water. It tries to go away from water. These are chemical forces. Therefore, if you take a couple of uh, phospholipid molecules, place them into the water, they may take this kind of orientation. Uh, the phosphoric acid heads, uh, sorry, try to go towards the water, and the glycerid tails repel it. If you very carefully place these molecules on the surface of the water, you may get this kind of uh, situation, a layer of phospholipid molecules 
where clearly the heads go, try to go to the water and the tails try to go away from the water. Similarly, combining B and C, it is possible to make this kind of bilayer of phospholipid molecules. Two layers in this way. And finally, this is the elementary structure of the membrane. The chemical forces are very strong forces when these molecules are close to each other. And therefore, even though this membrane is very, very thin, it is mechanically very strong. Here is the cell membrane. This is the way how it is illustrated nowadays. You find that on the blue color are shown the phospholipid molecules, which form the bilayer, the cell membrane. And in the membrane do exist certain kind of channels. I tell you in more detail very soon, which channels may be either open or close and may allow certain ions to flow through the membrane. How the cells do look like? Well, there are several, several different, different kind of cells. Here is a historically interesting uh, picture. It shows uh, a motor neuron. Uh, it is drawn by Dieters in 1896, and it was dissected from a mammal mammalian spinal cord. The other cells are stained by Golgi method and were drawn by Ramon Cajal. So here is a mitral cell from olfactory bulb of a rat. Here is a pyramidal cell which is from the cortex, from the brain of the mouse. The cell body is here and it has a lot of dendrites and axon. And here on the down left is a Purginia cell from the human cerebellum. Here is a side picture. You find that it is very, very thin, but it has a lot of these uh, dendrites. So, how cell looks like? Well, I would say that it looks like whichever. It has very several anatomical forms, different cells. Here is an electron microscopic picture of one cell. When teaching how a cell is constructed, its anatomy and uh, physiology, often is taken as an example a motor neuron. What is a motor neuron? Neuron is a neural cell. El motor means that it is connected to the uh, transforming or, or uh, transmitting the information from uh, the nervous system to the uh, muscles to control the movement, the motoric of the body. A motor neuron uh, has uh, here the cell body. Cell body, it is also called soma. Within the body, there do exist uh, the nucleus, as I did show before, and inside the nucleus, the nucleolus. Inside the nucleus is the DNA, the, the genetic information of, of the cell. There are several different structures, as I did show before. Endoplasmic reticulum, lipofuxin, mitochondrion, Golgi apparatus, and so on, and so on, and so on. From the cell body, from the soma, extends thin, uh, structures which are called dendrites. Do you see the dendrites here? And one long, possibly a little bit thicker structure than the dendrites, which is called axon. Axon is in motor neurons usually, not always, but usually surrounded with a structure which is called Schwann cell. It goes around the cell and it, it is an excellent electric insulator. Oops, I 
moving all the time the slides. Sorry about that. Uh, this is called myelin sheath. It is myelin, the, the material where this Schwann cell is constructed. They are these kind of pieces on the axon. Here is another one. Actually, the axon is much, much longer, and there are several uh, Schwann cells here, but it is drawn in this illustration only with two Schwann cells. Unrealistic. Between these Schwann cells, there is a region without this uh, uh, myelin, and that is called node of Ranvier. Schwann cells, of course, have also nucleus. Uh, here is the, uh, the muscle cell and the joint between this motor neuron and the muscle cell is called neuromuscular junction. The root of axon has the name axon hillock. Well, from the books of physiology, Today you find uh, very beautiful illustrations, full color illustrations about the cells. I don't go to the details. It is the same information here as I did show you. And here are the gentlemen who gave the names, uh, their names to these anatomical structures because they were the first one to find them. Uh, I mentioned the Schwann cell. Uh, it is named after uh, the uh, anatomist and physiologist Theodor Schwann. I think you might be interested to know that Schwann was born in Neuss. It is 80 kilometers northeast from Aachen, very close to here. We are just on the, on the path of uh, Theodor Schwann. His father was a goldsmith, later a printer. He studied at the Jesuit colleague in Cologne and then at Bonn. And finally, he died in Cologne. So he is just uh, our close fellow here in, in Aachen. Louis Antoine Ranvier, Ranvier Nodus, uh, is a French scientist, and Golgi was Italian. Well, here you see another picture. You have several, several pictures. I, I do have too many pictures of this. Maybe I do not go to the details too much. But this is some new information. Uh, the axons actually do not go alone from uh, uh, the nervous system to the, to the uh, muscles. They go in these kind of bundles. There are bundle of axons and bundle of bundles in the full nerve. Uh, that's called nerve fascicle. Fascicle means simply bundle. Here's a microscopic picture. So this is like an, an old telephone cable. You, you know in telephone cables there was uh, tens and hundreds of telephone lines in the telephone cable. This looks a bit similar. I mentioned the gentlemen Josef Erlanger and Herbert Gasser. Again, they received the Nobel Prize in 1944 for their discoveries relating to the highly differentiated functions of single nerve fibers. They measured with uh, electronic devices uh, the uh, nerve impulse and described that. They used for that purpose a vacuum tube. Well, I think you are so young generation that you don't perhaps know what is a vacuum tube. When I was in your age, I was uh, working with vacuum tubes. So I show you a picture of vacuum tube. This is more modern vacuum tube than, than what uh, Erlanger and Gasser made, but that is, uh, anyhow, that is an electronic amplifier, which was before transistors, and transistors were before integrated circuits. And they did dis <coughs> display that with a cathedrate oscilloscope. Who knows what is a cathedrate oscilloscope? I don't think anyone knows any. Okay, you know it here. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, they are, uh, they are, what, uh, what was made with ca cathedrate uh, oscilloscope long time ago is now made with just a computer screen. But I just want to mention, I just this morning found from the, from the web this picture of one cathedral oscilloscope. Herbert Gasser and Josef Erlanger uh, had a, an older style, but this, I just want to mention that this is a, this is a Heathkit assembly kit cathedral oscilloscope. It was uh, 
when I was uh, a bit uh, over 50 years ago, when, when I was uh, 50 years younger, I, I, my, my parents bought me this kind of assembly kit and, and I just uh, built this kind of this uh, cathedral oscilloscope and used that for, for looking how the, how the uh, electric signals did look like. But nowadays everyone is using a computer. But that's a, I, I'm kind of a dinosaurus here. Uh, here is an electronic microscope picture of Nodo Ranvier. And here is a neuromuscular junction, beautiful pictures. Nerve is coming down to the uh, neuromuscular junction. Here is important information also. Here is illustrated a cortical nerve cell, nerve cell from brain. And the information in this illustration is that to the soma and to the dendrites of this nerve cell come nerve fibers from other cells, from the axons, and they end here to the so-called end plates, and the information from a cell goes along axon, coming here from some other axon to these dendrites. And these connections just build the, the net uh, of, of the brain which, uh, which uh, uh, forms the, the information processing and information transform. So this is how they look like basically. Okay, pyramidal cells are beautiful picture here. And when this end of the axon touches the dendrite of the next axon, here is a joint which is called synapse. The nerve impulse comes along the axon to this synapse. This is called uh, presynaptic terminal and the dendrite here is called postsynaptic terminal. When the nerve impulse comes here, it happens something very strange. Inside the synapse the, or, or the end plate exist vesicles. Vesicles which uh, are like small spheres which include some transmit no, neurotransmitter chemical, neurotransmitter molecules. When the electric impulse comes here, these vesicles physically move down here to this end plate and they release this neurotransmitter chemical to this synaptic cleft. It is called synaptic cleft, this region here. This acetylcholine proceeds by diffusion to the uh, postsynaptic terminal and here are the ionic channels which open. So this is quite strange. Uh, information comes as an electric impulse to the synapse. It continues as a chemical uh, stuff, any chemical agent which is moving in the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic terminal, open the ionic channels and form electric impulse again. Well, it is not so simple because the electric impulse in the nerve axon also is a chemical process. But anyhow, this is how it goes. And again, Nobel Prizes. You find how many Nobel Prizes there are, they are all the time in bioelectromagnetism. There were Charles Scott Sherrington and Edgar Douglas Adrian, who received Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1932 for their discoveries regarding the functions of neurons. So it was, it was mainly Sherrington who described the process in the synapse. I may skip that. Okay, I go to muscle cells. Again, a microscopic picture of a muscle cell. Mus muscles are divided to three types. Uh, uh, there are, uh, or, or two types, striated muscles, and, and smooth muscles. And striated muscles are of two kinds. They, they are the skeletal muscles and the cardiac muscle. In the striated muscle, here is a, a whole muscle shown schematically. If it is, it is composed from fibers, if we magnify this picture with 100, we get see a fiber. Magnify that with 10, 
Here is the fiber and it is composed from fibrils. And if we magnify this fibril by 20, you see how the muscle fibril is composed. It has uh, filaments, thick filaments here and thin filaments, myosin and acting filaments. And here is a cross section. And the name striated muscle, it comes uh, from the fact that these uh, thick and thin filaments, they glide between each other when the muscle is contracting and therefore it looks like striated because, uh, uh, because the, the filaments form this kind of, uh, here you see they form this kind of, this kind of image. Uh, this is again a beautiful uh, illustration showing continuous magnification of the of the muscle. Here is a muscle cell and continuously it is magnified and magnified and magnified and magnified and magnified. So that's kind of fun, this kind of illustrations. How this contraction of the muscles take place? That's a complicated process, very complicated process. Uh, it takes energy, that is uh, energy what you get when you are eating hamburgers and drinking Coca-Cola, you get energy which makes it possible for, for uh, this function of contraction of muscles. W how it goes, it is illustrated as if these myosin heads would uh, pull uh, uh, the, the fibrils uh, uh, to move them. Does it really go so? I do not know, but it is it is it's complicated process and it is not necessary for this course to know how it goes, so we skip it, fortunately. I mentioned the electric impulse and that is the core phenomenon of bioelectromagnetism. What kind of electric impulses or electric phenomena there do exist? Well, there exist many, many kinds of those. I show you a schematic illustration of transmembrane potentials. What means transmembrane potential? It means that we take a voltmeter, reference is outside, and we place the uh, active electrode of the voltmeter inside the membrane. So we measure the potential, potential difference or voltage actually, it is called transmembrane potentials, voltage over the membrane, transmembrane. And what kind of readings we get? When the cell is in the resting state, inside the cell there is a potential, depending on the type of the cell, it may be different values, but typically it is given that it is minus 90 millivolts. Here is zero potential outside and inside minus 90 millivolt when the cell is in rest. If the potential is uh, uh, changing uh, closer to zero, it is called depolarizing because it is polarized and hyperpolarizing if it is increasing. <coughs> they are called excitatory and inhibitory uh, potential changes for the reason which you see in a minute. Nothing is stable in this world. This resting potential is not absolutely stable. It fluctuates and they are called pacemaker potentials. They may be triangular or sinusoidal or usually combination of those. Cells which are called receptors sensors or whichever, generate different kind of uh, fluctuations, potentials when they are irritated. For instance, here is a so-called Pacinian corpuscle, a sensor which, uh, which we have in the skin. When touching the skin, it reacts and gives signal. So when touching and pressing the uh, receptor cell, it gives uh, smaller or larger hyperpolarizing or depolarizing changes to the resting potential. Uh, there do exist also synaptic potentials, just as I told you when the information comes along an axon to a synapse, it is possible to record here 
synaptic potentials, changes in the membrane potential close to the synapse, either hyperpolarizing or depolarizing. And these synaptic potentials, they sum up in the, in, in the cell membrane region and they are called local potentials. And here in the axon hillock, if you get the higher and higher and higher changes, approaching a potential level which is called threshold. Finally, when it potential, potential change reaches the threshold, it generates the cell, generates a nerve impulse, which makes the inside potential a little bit positive and then back negative, actually more negative than in the rest. This is the bioelectric phenomenon, the bioelectric signal, which we are interested in. But you see that there are a lot of other kind of potential changes in the membrane. Let's have a piece of action with a microelectrode, which is a very thin glass tube. We feed a stimulating current through the cell membrane and we have a voltmeter connected here with another microelectrode. When we feed a stimulus current, negative, which is called inhibitory, the potential here changes, uh, uh, this is uh, according to the exponential curve, a bit more negative and then back when the stimulus is uh, discontinued. If it is excitatory stimulus, the same goes to the, this positive direction. A stronger stimulus makes like this and it may reach the threshold and generate the nerve impulse. If it is still stronger stimulus, it, uh, the potential reaches earlier the threshold and generates the excitation. This is just a, a, a real recording of a nerve impulse. This is a stimulus pulse and here is the nerve impulse photographed from the screen of the cathedrate tube. Here you see that there is a stimulus given so that uh, the potential reaches the threshold and generates ac activation. Stronger stimulus generates it earlier, still stronger, still earlier and much stronger, still earlier. So this relationship between the strength of the stimulus and the duration which is needed for reaching the threshold is called strength duration curve. I give you two concepts. These are not practically used today. They are a bit historical ones, but I would say that it's good to know they exist sometimes in the literature. Rail base is the smallest stimulus intensity which in theory with infinitely long stimulus makes the uh, cell to activate. If we take two times the rare base stimulus intensity, chronaxi is called the time which is needed with this stimulus intensity to generate the uh, activation. So rare base uh, indicates the sensitivity of the cell and chronaxi indicates the speed of the cell. There is inconsistency in the literature of the terms connect, connected to activation. I don't like the inconsistency, but I, I cannot beat against that, but I am allowed to tell what I, I think should be used, what kind of terms. Terminology used in connection with action impulse. I would like to call the process with the name action impulse. When it is recorded the activation on nerve cell, it should be called nerve impulse. And when it is recorded from muscle cell, it should be called muscle impulse. And when we measure the potential of the impulse, that should be called action potential. And when we measure the current connected to the activation, it should be called action current. 
But when you read the literature, all these are called action potential. And as engineers, electrical engineers, I think you understand that that is not theoretically correct. But that's how life goes. I go to the conduction of the nerve impulse in action. If nerve action is stimulated somewhere, the activation spreads to both directions along the axon. This is a theoretical case. This doesn't happen in, in nature usually. So here is an unmyelinated axon without the swan cells and it is activated here. So and the activation proceeds along the axon. I show it again. Activa stimulus comes here and activation proceeds along the axon. If there is a myelin sheath, the Schwann cells, and it is activated here in the node of Ranvier, what happens? The currents flow around the myelin sheath because it is a very good electric insulator. It doesn't proceed continuously in the axon, but it jumps over the Schwann cell and stimulates the next node of Ranvier and so on and so on. And this is called saltatoric conduction. Saltare means jump or dance in either Greek or Latin language. I don't remember ever which it is. What is the idea here? It's a great idea. It's a grand idea. The nature has great ideas. The idea is and with this structure having the myelin sheaths, the speed of activation in the axon is much, much faster than in unmyelinated action. That's a great thing. Conduction velocity in unmyelinated actions, it is given with this equation. Velocity of the nerve impulse uh, I sub A max is the maximum sodium current per unit length. V sub TH is threshold voltage. R, R sub I is axial resistance per unit length, and C sub M is membrane capacitance per unit length. In myelinated axons, the equation, its uh, approximative e equation, it is simple. Uh, the velocity is uh, about six times axon diameter. And here is an experimental data. It is measured the speed of conduction, conduction velocity, in axons which have different uh, diameters. You see that the uh, relationship is surprisingly linear. I go to chapter 3, sub-threshold membrane phenomena. I may skip this. And I go to Nernst equation, and it was Walter Hermann Nernst who received a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1920 in recognition of his work in thermochemistry. I say again that nothing is simple in the nature. Nothing is simple. And uh, the, nurse, the theory behind the Nernst equation is very, very complicated. It can be shown if you go to the more and more details, it is very complicated. But I do not want to discourage you. The, finally, the result in Nernst equation is rather simple. I will show you how to derive the Nernst equation. I don't suggest that you learn it by heart or the story, but you, it's good that you get an impression, an image, how the things go finally to the Nernst equation. Nernst equation, what is it? It's a fundamental, fundamental equation in bioelectric phenomena, and it is very important to understand what it means. And I will tell you what it means. Once again, a novelist, Svante Arrhenius received the Nobel Prize in 1903 in chemistry in recognition of the extraordinary services he has rendered 
to the advancement of chemistry by his electrolytic theory of dissociation. So you find how important is bioelectromagnetism. We go from Nobel Prize to Nobel Prize to Nobel Prize all the time. I take this very simple example. We have a vessel. There is water. And there is a membrane here which has holes and there do exist ions of type K on this side and on the other side. There are more ions on one side, concentration is higher, and less ions on the other side, concentration is lower. The membrane has holes through which the ions are able to flow. Why do we have this membrane? It is a practical issue. If we wouldn't have the membrane, the concentration would change quite continuously from one side to the other one. But when we have the membrane, then the concentration is quite constant on one side, changes at the membrane and is again constant on the other side. So this is a practical issue here. And you may guess that this membrane, having these holes, it uh, represents the cell membrane. And inside the cell is here on the left and outside of the cell on the right in this example. It is said that the charge, these are ions which are charged particles they are of type K. This is a bit strange, but it is theoretically correct because there may be different kind of uh, ions, chemically different kind of ions, and they are just indexed that the, of the type K. They may be sodium, potassium, chloride, whichever, but they are theoretically indexed that they are of type K. Due to diffusion, there is a force forcing the ions to flow from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. I think you, you easily know this and understand this, this concept. When there is a high concentration of something in the, in the water, it, uh, it starts to spread and diffuse through, throughout everywhere, making the concentration finally constant. So here is a J sub KD. J means a flow, sub K is just an index telling that we do have at the moment the type K ions. And D indicates diffusion. Let us then place here a voltage. We take a battery and place electrodes here, plus and minus. There is an electric field. And because these particles are electrically charged, this electric field makes a force forcing them to move in this direction. So now we have flow of ions type K due to the electric field sub E. Finally, they are moving in both directions, both reasons, so long time that these fluxes, the flows of ions are equal in both directions and when they are equal in both directions the, the situation is stable and that situation is called equilibrium, kind of bala balancing, balancing state. This is important situation, equilibrium, please remember it. I start to derive the very, very important Nernst equation. Please, please sit down. Please go, don't go away, even though I give a lot of equations to you. I start with electric potential and electric field. The work W sub E required to move charge Q from point O to point P is 
W sub E equals to Q phi sub P minus phi sub O. W sub E is work in joules, Q is charge in coulombs, and phi is potential in volts. This is the simple equation which you have learned long, long time ago in your study, so uh, electricity. The work W sub E, which is required to move one mole of ions from point O to point P, is W sub E equals to Zf times phi sub P minus phi sub O, where W sub E is work, joules per mole in this case. Z is the valence of the item, atoms, no, sorry, valence of the ions. F is Faraday's constant. 9.649 times 10 to fourth power coulombs per mole and phi is potential. This is the work. If a unit positive charge is moved, a vector displacement ds, the required work is dw equals to minus e dot ds. This is the, the vector equation. If we ap apply the previous equation 3.1 to this equation 3.3, it gives phi sub p minus phi sub o equals to dw equals to minus e dot ds. The Taylor series expansion of the scalar field phi about the point o and analog and along the path s is phi sub p equals to phi sub o plus d phi over d s times ds and so on. Since p is very close to o, the remaining higher terms may be neglected and uh, in equation 3.5 and we get 3.6, phi sub p minus phi sub o equals to nabla phi dot ds. And from equations 3.4 in the previous slide and this 3.6, we deduct that e equals to minus nabla phi. Electric field is negative gradient of potential. According to Ohm's law, the current density and electric field are related. J equals to sigma E, which is coming from the previous equation, is minus sigma nabla phi. As I said just a minute ago, the ionic flux exists due to two reasons, due to electric field and due to diffusion. Ionic flux due to electric field J sub K E, J is ionic flux, K is the type of ions we have, and E means due to electric field, equals to minus mu sub K times Z sub K over absolute value Z sub K times Z, C sub K nabla F. This is ionic flux. Uh, moles per square centimeter dot s. U uh, mu sub k is ionic mobility, z sub k is valence, and c sub k is ionic concentration. Ionic flux due to diffusion. J sub k d equals to minus d sub k nabla c sub k, where j sub k d is ionic flux due to diffusion. D sub k is fixed constant, which is diffusion constant, and C sub k is ionic concentration. Now I give you the connection between ionic mobility, mu sub k, and diffusion constant D sub k. It is D sub k equals to mu sub k times RT over absolute value Z sub k times F. This equation was derived by Albert Einstein and that was the good reason to take this equation to, to this uh, lecture so that I can refer to Mr. Einstein. I'm very proud to be able to refer to Mr. Einstein, who received a Nobel Prize in Physics 1921. And you may perhaps not know that he did not receive the Nobel Prize from the development of the uh, general relativity, uh, but he received it from the photoelectric effect, which is a bit surprising. Now I come to nearest Planck equation. Please don't go away. Please just sit down and, and, and uh, believe that I'm close to soon approaching the next equation. Nearest Planck equation 
the total, total ionic flux due to diffusion and electric field. Total ionic flux J sub K due to diffusion J sub K D and electric field J sub K E equals, we just combine equations 3.9 and 3.10, minus D sub K times nabla C sub K plus C sub K Z sub K F over R T times nabla phi. Ionic flux converted to electric current happens by multiplying Z sub K times Faraday constant F and we get J sub K is here just multiplied by Z sub K F. And we come to Nernst Planck equation. Max Planck received the Nobel Prize from discovery of the energy quanta in 1918. One Nobelist again. And Nernst Planck equation is here, coming from the previous equations, uh, perhaps I, I, I don't go too much into details. It describes electric current density due to diffusion and due to electric field. It is their sum. In equilibrium, as I said, the flux due to diffusion ionic flux due to diffusion and due to electric field are equal but opposite and equilibrium for the kth ion the net electric current density for the kth ion is zero and in the equation 3.13 j sub k is zero it is shown here j sub k is zero which means that this is zero and then now i may skip a little bit i don't go too much to the details Transposing terms in equation 315 gives this. Thin planar membrane derived along normal X. Equation 1317 can be rearranged to give this. And integrate from intracellular to extracellular space. We come to carrying out the integration 319 gives this. Where C sub I K and C sub O K denotes the intracellular and extracellular concentrations respectively. The equilibrium voltage across the membrane for the kth ion is V sub K is phi sub I minus phi sub O and therefore voila, ta-da, finally Ernst Nernst equation. <coughs> Did you follow it? Sure, yes, in detail. We came finally to the Nernst equation. I wanted to go through all this long story before I give you the Nernst equation, therefore that you get an impression how the things go. And this was a simplified version of the nature, very much simplified version. All this, what I did show you, you can find from the book, all the equations, they are listed there. Nernst equation tells that V sub K equals to minus RT over Z sub KF logarithm C sub I K over C sub O K. And let's try to understand what's going on here. Uh, R is a gas constant. T is absolute temperature. Z is valence. F is Faraday's constant, C sub I is concentration inside, and C sub O is concentration outside. And all these are given for the type K ions. So if we do have only one kind of ions in the world, we can just delete the K, but these are just to indicate universally that for certain kind of ions sub K, equation is so. For practical purposes, we can simplify this by inserting the temperature, which is a body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. The valence is 1 for uh, sodium, potassium and chloride. And in inserting the gas constant and Faraday constant and converting the natural logarithm to the Briggs logarithm with uh, base 10, we obtain for voltage in millivolts minus 61 times logarithm C sub I 
overseas and all. This is practically the nursing question. And now comes the thousand dollars question. What in the world is the nurse equation? What does it tell to you? Is, are you brave enough to say it? Please tell. Uh, the voltage between the inner and the outer cells. You are close. You are very close. You are very close. You should, yeah, I thank you very much for this good beginning. You should say that in what kind of situation? Say it's still more exactly. You're approaching? You're approaching? Okay. The trick is, you are on the right path. The trick is that this tells the voltage over the membrane. In the case, when there do exist only one type of ions which contribute to the membrane voltage which is non-natural. It is non-natural. So in general, when you take from, from uh, this from the cat a neuron on the table and measure what is the voltage, this does not tell it. Please remember this. This does not tell in general case when there do exist several kind of ions which contribute to the membrane voltage. But this tells what is the membrane voltage in the case, non-natural case, when there exists only one kind of ion which contributes to that. So this is the trick. Please remember this. On the other hand, we can say that uh, this tells what must be the membrane voltage, the transmembrane voltage, to stop this kind of ions flowing through the membrane to, mem to make the current ion flow zero to make it equilibrium. So this is, the, this is the key point and I always, which is natural, I always get the answer that it tells about the membrane voltage but it is, it is not the truth, it is true that it tells it only in the case when only one kind of ion is able to contribute to that. That is the trick. This is the fundamental equation in, gen in the generation of membrane potentials, bioelectric potentials. So I re-show the, the illustration here. The nurse equation tells that when we have only one kind of ions here, what shall be the voltage to make the flux of ions zero with the existing concentrations? Only one kind of ions. I try to explain this with this kind of illustration. This may uh, help you or it may confuse you. I don't know, but just try to show you a little bit we, how we can also think the uh, behavior of, of, of the uh, nurse equation. Assume that we have an axon. Inside the axon is an electrode and axon is in the experimental chamber, which is a metal cylinder, which is the other electrode. Uh, let's assume that there are only sodium sorry, only potassium ions in this experiment. And the potassium ion concentrations are such that the membrane voltage is shown here. Here is inside of the membrane. This is the membrane and that's outside of the membrane. And we switch a battery between the electrodes, which is the same voltage as the nursed voltage for uh, potassium ions, then the situation is stable. There's due to diffusion, some ions are flowing in and out, but the net flux is zero. If we now force with a battery, a different kind of battery, the potential inside to raise closer to zero, 
there is a potential difference between the existing membrane potential and the potassium nursed potential. And therefore, potassium ions tend to flow from in to out. If we switch the switch to C, which means that we inside of the membrane force the potential to be more negative than the nursed voltage. Then there is a gradient from out to in and the potassium ions tend to flow from out to in. That's how it goes. What is the origin of the resting voltage? Where it comes from? Very early description, one of the first description was given by this very friendly looking guy, Julius Bernstein, uh, who was a founder of the membrane theory. He worked in University of Halle and he was a pupil of Helmholtz, our very good friend Helmholtz. Let's assume situation. We have the axon and we have inside the axon potassium ion concentration 400 moles per cubic meter and we have the same concentration of potassium ions outside. Then we have inside sodium ion concentration 50 moles per cubic meter and the same concentration of sodium ions outside. If we do have for both types of ions the same concentrations in and outside respectively then there is nothing happening if we place a microelectrode inside and measure the potential compared to the outside it is zero. It does not generate any potential differences. Bringing the axon here does not make any potential differences. Let us keep inside the, potential, the concentration the same, but change outside the potassium concentration to 20 and sodium concentration to 440. Now there exists strong gradient in the ion concentrations. It exists a strong gradient for potassium ions to flow from inside to outside because there's high concentration inside and low concentration outside. And the membrane has the pores, the, the, uh, the holes through which potassium may flow and they quite freely flow from inside to outside. They take positive charge from inside to out, making the inside more negative. How about the sodium ions? There is a strong concentration gradient for sodium ions as well. High concentration outside, low concentration inside. Similarly, they try to flow from outside to in, but, but the channels, ionic channels for sodium ions are closed. And the sodium ions are not able to flow from outside to in and compensate these potentials. Therefore, there is inside the membrane negative charge. Please note that each type of ions, sodium and potassium ions, they, they behave their, their own way. They don't care about the other ions. They just they, they obey uh, the laws of uh, diffusion and electric field. This is the way how the inside comes negative. Quite simple explanation. And what will be the uh, uh, potential inside that can be found from Nernst equation? The potassium ions flow from in to out as long time as Nernst equation allows them when the concentration gradient corresponds to the uh, voltage gradient, which is given by the Nernst equation. Nernst equation is the fundamental law. Membrane with multi-ion permeability. Uh, I give you some concepts. I don't discuss this later on anymore. 
Donnan equilibrium. Assume that transmembrane ion pump is disabled. In, in this case, very large ion movements will take place, resulting in changed ionic concentrations. When equilibrium is reached, every ion is at its nearest potential, <coughs> which is also the transmembrane potential. Now this is the equation. This condition is referred to as Donnan equilibrium. Frederick George Donnan, shown here, he did not get the Nobel Prize. Uh, here is an uh, equivalent circuit of an uh, electric equivalent circuit of the cell membrane. This is given now in the sub-threshold situation. What means sub-threshold? It means the situation where the membrane potential, uh, potential inside the membrane is below the threshold, so everything is passive. Nothing active happens, everything is passive. Very simple uh, equivalent circuit. Intracellular medium is here above, and extracellular medium is below. Please note that when you uh, just uh, browse literature of, of bio, uh, bioelectric phenomena and electric, uh, electrical properties of cells, in every second book you find that intracellular medium is above and extracellular is below, and in every second book they are other way around. So there is no international standard how it should be shown. I selected this standard, this is my standard in the book. It's not any better than any other, but there has to be one standard systematically in the book. There flows current through the membrane. It is defined in this direction now. There is a potential difference, so let's take first, the potential difference, potential inside and potential outside, and then there is a, a current flowing from inside to outside. The current, the membrane current may be divided to four different uh, currents. One is capacitive current through the capacitance which is formed by the very thin membrane. One microfarad per square centimeter is the value. Sodium ion current, potassium ion current, and so-called leakage current which practically is chloride. And in these three paths, there are two electrical components in each. There is a corresponding conductance for that current and Nernst voltage due to the concentrations. I just show you, I don't tell you yet about the activation. I come very soon to that. But in the activation, the difference is that these conductivities, conductances of sodium and potassium are not constant during the activation. They change and they depend from two factors. One is the voltage over the conductance and the other one is time. But I return to this. I come now to the goldman hodgkin cuts equation. We learned that Nernst equation does not tell what is the membrane potential <laughs> in general case. It tells that in the very special artificial case. But it is the goldman hodgkin cuts equation which gives in general case, in the natural case. It tells how they are related, interacted. And the equation, it is shown here, minus uh, membrane voltage is minus RT over F times logarithm uh, concentrations of ions of potassium, sodium and chloride. And here is a permeability coefficient, P sub K, for each P sub Na and P sub Cl. And please note that there are the inside concentration of potassium and sodium in the nominator and inside concentration of chloride in the denominator, and of course for uh, outside, other way around. So why is this? Why are these pot so potassium and sodium on the nominator, for inside, and for chloride in the denominator? What is the reason? 
it's simpler, simple. Why is it the other way around? You may guess it. Yes, please. Exactly. So potassium and sodium ions are positive and chloride is negative. That's it. goldman hodgkin katz equation was derived by David Goldman, Alan Lloyd Hodgkin and Sir Bernard Katz. And Hodgkin and Katz received the Nobel Prizes. Again, this goldman hodgkin katz equation may be simplified or returned to the real situation, the room temperature and natural logarithm and so on, equally so same way as the Nernst equation. I demonstrate that the goldman hodgkin katz equation is straightforward extension of the Nernst equation. They are the same issue, Nernst equation is for one type of ion and goldman hodgkin katz equation is for several types of ion. So let us make an assumption. Let's assume that we first have a real, real nerve cell and we find that the membrane voltage is obtained with the goldman hodgkin katz equation in this way. We know the permeability coefficients and concentrations and we calculate it like that. Then, the, let us take all the chloride ions away from inside and from outside so that the concentration of chloride ions inside and outside is zero. What happens? Then this part of the equation is deleted because concentration C sub O and C sub I are zero. This is deleted. Let us then assume that uh, the membrane is not permeable for sodium ions. The sodium ion channels will be completely closed. P sub Na is zero. Then this term is deleted because those are zeros. Now it is simplified like this and in this case if P sub K has uh, some realistic value, it is deleted and voila. Now you see that goldman hodgkin katz equation is simplified to Nernst equation because only one type of ion, in this case potassium ion, is contributing to the membrane voltage. Now you see it. This is the Nernst equation. Uh, I mentioned briefly reversal voltage, the membrane potential at which the net membrane current is zero. When the membrane voltage increased or decreased, it is at this potential that the membrane current reverses its or sign and is zero. And the equation for reversal voltage is given. With this equation, it resembles the Nernst equation, but it includes two types of ions. Let us now look how the ions do flow through the membrane. Let's take an example. We make the experiment with the cat motor neuron. Cat, cat motor neurons are usually used as examples. It is easy to catch a cat and easy to take a motor neuron from the cat. So let us measure, let us measure from a cat motor neuron the ion concentrations. We just measure with some, some probe what are the concentrations. And we find that for sodium ions outside the membrane, concentration is 150 moles per square meter and inside 15. Potassium ions correspondingly 5.5 and 150 and chloride 125 and 9. Then we calculate we calculate from the Nernst equation that the Nernst voltage for sodium ion, you, you should now know what is the Nernst voltage, we calculate it is plus 61, for potassium ions minus 88, and for chloride it is minus 70. And then we 
measure that the resting voltage in the cat motor neuron is minus 70 millivolts. Now we try to make some conclusions of this situation. What, what, what's going on there? What the nursed voltage means? It means that if the potential inside were plus 61 millivolts, then with these concentrations, the sodium ions would be in equilibrium. But it is not, it is not plus 61 millivolts. It is minus 70. So there is a very big difference. So there must be a very strong force forcing the sodium ions to flow from outside to inside because there's so big difference from the equilibrium. But because they do not flow, apparently the sodium ion channels are closed. How is it with potassium? Potassium ions with these concentrations would be in equilibrium if the potential inside were minus 88 millivolts. But it is not. It is minus 70. It is not in equilibrium, but it is closer to equilibrium than for sodium ions. So apparently the potassium ion channels are not fully closed, but they are a bit open, allowing the potassium ions to flow somehow through the membrane. And how is it for chloride? The chloride ions do have such a concentration ratio that they are in equilibrium if the potential inside is minus 70 millivolts and it is minus 70 millivolts, which indicates that chloride ions are in equilibrium. There is no force trying to move them in either direction. They have just taken the equilibrium situation. That's how it looks like. This was illustrated with this kind of il uh, situation, with this kind of illustration by John Eccles, who received the Nobel Prize in 1963 with Hodgkin and Huxley. This is a famous illustration. I could go through this illustration, uh, but I, uh, I wanted to draw this illustration in a bit, bit different way, and I show it here. In the same issue. It is Eccles's uh, idea. I just show it in a bit different way. So, here is the cell membrane. On the left is uh, inside. On the right is outside. I show the situation for sodium ions. Inside the membrane, the potential is minus 90 millivolts. Sodium ions do have such a concentration ratio that they would be in equilibrium if inside the potential would be plus 65 millivolts. The numbers are not a bit different because these are for squid action and in the previous slide I did show it for cat motor neuron. But in principle, the idea is the same. So there is a gradient of 155 millivolts to force the sodium ions to flow from outside to in. But they do not flow too much because the sodium ion channels are closed. They are flowing a little bit, but not very much. There do exist a so-called sodium potassium ion pump in the membrane, which is compensating this flux. It pumping the ions in the same amount from inside to out. Because it's pumping against the gradient, it is needing metabolic energy to run and the metabolic energy you get from eating hamburgers and drinking Coca-Cola, as I used to say. How about with the potassium ions? Potassium ions have such a concentration ratio that the nearest voltage in squid action is minus 101 millivolts 
and the existing transmembrane voltage is minus 90 millivolts, so there's only 11 millivolts gradient. Potassium ions are flowing quite much through the membrane, even though the gradient is so small, but the channels are open. Diffusional flux passively flows a bit inwards, oops, and there, there is a sodium potassium ion pump which makes the rest of the pumping so that flux outwards and inwards are equal. For chloride ions, they are in such a concentration ratio that their nearest voltage equals to the uh, existing resting potential. So they are flowing back and forth, but the net flux is zero. So that is the situation. I go to the cable equation of the axon. What is the story of the cable equation? Well, the, the story of the cable equation is to show how the voltages or potential change in the passive resting axon when it is stimulated. Uh, it is, the axon is modeled with a coaxial cable and it is, uh, so it is not new information, coaxial cable equations you, you know from, from uh, uh, radio technology well and uh, this it is the purpose is to demonstrate that this is how the voltages in the axon behave as well. That is the story. This is a classical theory which you find from all uh, electrophysiology books and I, I go rather quickly through this. Cable equation of the axon is based on the following model. There is an inside of the axon outside of the axon and the axon is divided to small pieces and each piece is modeled with the inside resistance, outside resistance and transmembrane circuit which is uh, uh, transmembrane resistance, uh, resting voltage battery and uh, membrane capacitance and the current through the membrane is divided to ionic current and capacitive current. And the simple equations may be drawn for this uh, electric circuit. Uh, let's go directly here. The membrane current is minus delta I sub I over delta X equals to delta I sub O over delta X. And the idea here is that, that both currents, inside and outside currents, are defined positive to, to the right. And of course, the same amount of current which is going inside the membrane to the right is going outside the membrane to the left. So therefore, this uh, minus sign is here. And the membrane voltage change as a function of distance is delta phi i over delta x minus delta phi o over delta x is minus i sub i r sub i plus i sub o r sub o. And the second derivative is minus r sub i delta i over delta x plus delta plus r sub o times delta i sub o over delta x. The steady state response means that when there is a continuous constant steady current stimulating the axon, it is measured how the potential inside the axon behaves as a function of distance from the stimulation point. The steady state responses get got through this general cable equation which was given in the previous slide, whose solution is V prime equals to R times E to the power of minus X over lambda plus B times E to the power X over lambda. Where lambda is so-called characteristic length it is square root of r sub m over r sub i plus r sub o, which is about r sub square root r sub m over r sub i, because r sub o is much smaller than r sub i. 
the solution for this is shown here. It is the exponential curve. Where the potential, this is a relative curve now, one is the potential change at the stimulation location. Uh, the potential decreases to 37% from the maximum value at the distance of the characteristic length. And from here the same goes to the next characteristic length and so on and so on. So this is the exponential curve. So the message, the simple message of this, what I told here is that when the action is stimulated with a constant current, the potential inside the action changes, increases at the stimulation location and decreases as a function of distance along according to the exponential curve. This is the message. Let us take a stimulation with a step current impulse. So at instant of time, when time is zero, it is given started a stimulus and let's see how it behaves. Membrane current is composed from resistive current and capacitive current. And under transient conditions, this equation is substituted to the previous equation and we get this equation and we got the stimulation and its solution is here where tau is so-called time constant, it is membrane uh, R sub M times C sub M. And solution of this equation is given here. We stimulate, start the stimulation at time t equals to zero. So the step current impulse. And we observe what is the change of the potential here, 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 and here. And find that at the time when it is 30 milliseconds, which is 0 0.36 times time constant, the potential changes like this. A bit later, when it is the time constant time, it is like that. And a bit later like that. And finally, after infinite length of time, which is a steady state situation, the behavior is exactly exponential curve. These are not exponential curves. And when we observe how the potential changes as a function of time in this location, it changes like that. At that location, changes like that. And uh, the third location, like that. This is the behavior. Here it is shown all the story which I did show here before. Is membrane voltage response as a function of distance with tau as a parameter, function of uh, tau as a distance a parameter, and then stimulus current off behaves like that, which I show here. I switch on the stimulus current and see how the be potential behaves. It behaves like that when the stimulus is increasing and when the stimulus is switched off, it behaves like that. So that's it. What about that? Okay, that's it. Uh, I give you just some real values for the sum cable constants for different uh, unmyelinated actions of different species of animals. Uh, the action diameter for squid, it's kind of octopus, I come to this. Diameter is 500 micrometers, lobster 75 and grave is 30. Please see how much thicker is squid action. This is very fundamentally important. I come to this next time. Characteristic length given for those species, time constant for those species, specific resistance of the membrane for those species. And I told this before, specific capacitance of the membrane, one microfarad per square centimeter in each case. Uh, the strength duration equation 
curve is okay it was given here but that equation for that was given in the previous slide it is given here I don't go too much to the details now the time is running out Di uh, this I did show you already before and strength duration curve is shown here in this equation is given here here are some Cronach values for excitable tissue so it tells how fast these uh, tissues are frog is not so fast animal even though, though we may think that it is jumping beautifully but it does don't have constant body temperature and uh, for man uh, the Cronach values are smaller than for frog turtle is uh, uh, well is known to be a very slow animal here is cardiac muscle that is skeletal muscle and that is cardiac muscle chronaxis you see that cardiac muscle is very slow muscle it, uh, it has long chronaxis and uh, smooth muscle uh, smooth muscle exists in the intestines like also in the womb of, of females and for instance uh, the hairs on the skin are raised with smooth muscle they are very slow muscles you find that the chronaxis is very uh, long for frog smooth muscle is measured for nerve it is uh, uh, smaller shorter and so on and now I have gone through the chapter 3 and the next issue will be chapter 4 active behavior of the membrane and I am happy to tell you that next Tuesday so I hope I did not give you too many equations even though I'm afraid that I gave you too many equations. But please come next time also. I give you some more equations next time. <laughs> Thank you very much.